just want to make sure uh, or determine how we're going to do the introduction to your session, uh, Sotoyo. I assume that um, the you know the organizers will do that. I wasn't given any materials. Oh, really? Uh, I'm Not assuming they they did have the material, so they do have the material uh, for. So do you, do you want to confirm from them, Elizabeth, whether they are going to do the introductions or you will? Yeah, I think I'll try to send a chat. Okay, yeah, because I think they are, they are live here. You can ask one of them. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the evening session of day four. This has been the Nigeria FinTech Week 2020 and we've had three and a half amazing days of learning, of innovation, and of exchange of ideas, new ideas, new thinking that we need to survive in the post-COVID world. This evening, I would say that the plane has reached cruising altitude, yeah? And that's the most enjoyable time of a flight. And this is when we sort of listen to those who have also built around fin FinTech and have solved very major problems across Africa. Um, it's, a, it's an evening session and we'll have both a keynote and a panel session. Uh, two sessions will be running parallel. So if you are on the platform, please choose the session you want to you, you, you selected earlier. Uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, you could watch either. Uh, the first session would be on uh, payment service bank and agency banking solutions for financial inclusion. And that session will feature a keynote a keynote by Sitoyo Lopukoit, who is the Chief Financial Services Officer, Safricom, and Interim CEO, M-PESA. Um, and that will, follow, that will follow immediately after by a panel session uh, chaired by Dr. Lisbeth McQuarrie of uh, Greenbrook Capital Partners, um, and Hassan Husman, CEO of Jay's Bank, um, Alan, Alan, Alan Sinfield, CEO of Nine Mobile, uh, Jamilino Akbog, Akobeto, uh, DFS expert, AFDB, and Ugochi, Ugochi Ibojikwe, um, country manager, Uzotech. And running simultaneously is also another session that will feature on the future of payments and lending. Uh, this, the keynote for this session will be delivered by Matt Flannery, founder and CEO, Branch International. And the panel session will follow immediately as well and the, the session will be chaired by Tolu Lokbe Osindero, um, Head Legal and Compliance Branch International, Dioye uh, Ojuroye, uh, CFO Providence Bank, Davidson Oturu, uh, Partner ALX, uh, Joseph Hodge, Chief Strategy Officer Switch, uh, Sophia Zab, Global Head Commercial and Marketing Palm Play. So sit back and relax because this session promises to be interesting educating and exciting. My name is Chukameka Fred Agbata, and I'm glad to be your host for the FinTech Week 2020. Um, if you can hear me, Sitoyo, um, it's over to you for your panel session. Immediately after that, um, the, the panel will be led by, for your keynote, sorry. Immediately after that, the panel will be led by Dr. Lisbeth. If you can hear me, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's great to be at the Nigeria FinTech Week. Uh, it's day four, um, and it's exciting to be here. We're in the last session of the week, and um, really, really happy to to be to, to be on uh, uh, this uh, session. Uh, it's going to be a great session, but also um, it would have been great to be physically there and, and, and interact. Uh, but uh, it is the way it is today. I, I just want to start first by giving a story. I think when uh, people hear about M-Pesa. It's always about the brand and 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 the uh, great things it's done. But uh, I want to start with a lady called Mama Lena, and uh, this is a lady who wakes up in Nairobi at 3 a.m. in the morning and goes to her phone and borrows a micro loan for ten dollars or a thousand shillings, and then goes to the market and buys uh, groceries, vegetables, fish and so on and so forth, and then goes to a construction site. 
and makes tea and some uh, buy things for uh, the, the construction workers, then makes for them lunch. And by four o'clock, she's back at home and feeding her family. And in that day, she makes a profit of, of about uh, five to eight dollars uh, from that. And then in the evening, repays her, her loan. This happens to five, six million people in Kenya on a daily basis. Uh, this, and this helps spars the, the economy. But Mama Lena is very unique in terms of when she started, she was alone. Today, she employs five other women and she's in five construction sites. Uh, combined, uh, they have 24 children that they're supporting and their larger family. Today, she makes the region of about $20 a day. And considering that the daily income wage in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is about a dollar, you can see the impact that it has, that she's able to get a loan without any collateral by just using, uh, by how Safaricom and M-Pesa are using data to be able to credit score. Uh, today in Kenya, uh, we issue more than $15 million worth of loans a day. And these loans have an NPL of less than 3%. So you can see the massive uh, transformation that, that uh, uh, the products and services that we have. So just wanted to give, start by giving a context about what the impact of, 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 of um, M-Pesa uh, in Kenya. So well, I, what I started by saying that uh, M-Pesa is touted a world over as being the most successful. Now, we don't see it that way. Um, I met an engineer and in, in the head of engineering at Tesla, and he said he doesn't know even how their cars are because they spend 17 hours a day working on, on perfecting the car. That only when they go out of the factory and travel the world, the people say, man, you guys work in a great, You've got an amazing car. And it feels exactly the same way. We, we really focus on trying to transform lives. We really focus on trying to, uh, to better uh, our products and services, really focus on being customer obsessed. And we've really been trying to focus on, 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 on the digital uh, transformation that we're looking at. So just to give a bit of context of what that output is, is today there are 26.5 million uh, active MPESA customers in Kenya. In M-Pesa Africa, it's over 42 million. Uh, we do about 21 million transactions. These are chargeable transactions. If you add airtime, it's in the region of 30, 35 million transactions per day. Uh, to translate, it's about 1,200 transactions per second. So it does beat PayPal and MoneyGram combined in terms of the number of transactions it does uh, on a daily basis. But I think, Despite the stats that we see uh, on payments, lending, a uh, number of customers, I think the heartbeat of what of M-Pesa and Safaricom is about transforming lives. And this is a key ethos uh, of, of what we do. It, we always say purpose, people, and then profit. Those are the three things, purpose, people, profit. So if, it, if, if it's purpose-led, then, then, then we believe in it. And I can give an example and I'll give it a bit later on a product I think a lot of, it's, it's now become one of the most famous products that Tesla has done, which is called Fuliza, which is the first contextual overdraft. Uh, we spent close to $20 million uh, in developing the product with, without the business case. We thought, it, we felt, and we looked at it from a purpose perspective, it was going to transform lives. And in Mpesa, the, once the purpose part is there, we don't look at, what is the cost? If we believe it's gonna transform lives, we're gonna do it. And that's, that's from 13 years ethos of M-Pesa, when it started to not for profit, it was actually to transform lives. And that's been the, the ethos. Safaricom is a very successful company, uh, the largest in East Africa. We just turned 20 last week and it's great. Uh, and M-Pesa is only 13 years old uh, and it's uh, and still in its infancy stage. So as I said, it's, it's all about how do we position ourselves and how do we make an impact? And a good example is when we talk about financial inclusion, when MPESA started in 2007, it was at 23%. Last year, uh, given the, the statistics that the Central Bank of Kenya released, it's at 83, 84% and the third highest in Africa. While that is touted as good and everybody talks about financial inclusion, I think, what we're missing is financial health. And this is the ability for customers to be able to absorb shocks that happen. And in Africa, this happens quite a bit. 
So whether it's a crop did not uh, the uh, the crop uh, the crops were destroyed, is it a health crisis? I mean, is it death? Uh, is it education? And then various shocks that that, that our, our customers experience, and that part of financial health is reported at about twenty percent, and we want it to be up towards 50% and above. And we're working on different products and services related to savings, related to wealth management, related to insurance. And, and this is, it, it's, it's not a really nice part of payment and lifestyle, but it is actually critical uh, for the sustenance of, of financial services. And that's why this topic that we're discussing that touches on distribution um, and, and payment system banks is, is actually quite key because these are the products and services that our customers need. But m when, when m -Pesa started, it started as a send money proposition. And we've moved from a send money proposition to a payments platform. Today, we're a fully fledged payments platform with open APIs integrated to over 200,000 businesses in this country. We've got 28 international partners such as Google, PayPal, uh, AliExpress, World Remit, and today over 70% of all remittances that come into Kenya terminate on M-Pesa. But that's, that's where we are today, but that's not where we want to be. When I talk about financial health, the next phase of M-Pesa, of what we see in financial services, is to become a fully-fledged financial services provider. Now, this is moving away from the, the payments become the baseline, and what we anchor on top is all these new financial services that, that, we, that can be done. We've seen with Ant Financials in, in China that they have been able to create the largest wealth management platform. And I think they're, they're something close to three, $400 billion in, in the wealth management. And this is from millions of customers saving small amounts of money by being able to be given great value uh, from, from uh, the interest that they earn or the protection that they get in, in terms of wealth management. So we see that as a big area um, going forward, providing more savings solutions, providing more financial services and at a lower cost than today uh, that we currently uh, do. So MPESA in terms of driving banking penetration. So in 2007 in Kenya, there were 5 million bank accounts. In 2012, there was a revolution. And this is where we partnered with the banks. We partnered with NCBA, which is the bank in Kenya, to form the first collaboration between a telco and a bank that enable customers to open bank accounts electronically from the comfort of their home. And in that same time, we created the credit scoring mechanism. So they were able to save as a, uh, and they were able to lend within five seconds of opting in. With that, today, more than 40 million bank accounts in Kenya have been opened through that channel of them through MPESA. And this has been great for both the banking industry and has been great for us as a telecommunication company that is looking to be more of a tech company uh, in future. So this, that collaboration has gone further in terms of, in terms of partnerships. We've partnered with the largest commercial bank, which is KCB in Kenya, to open more financial services products in it. Today, both Mshwari by NCBA and KCB Mpesa each have over 20 million customers uh, in it. We've partnered with APSA, we've partnered with, with other commercial banks. We are also providing our data uh, and, and, and giving banks the ability to, to open bank accounts as well as credit score using our data. So that, that revolution between uh, uh, M-PESA or financial services partner and the bank is, is quite, quite unique and actually does transform. The, the reason for this partnership is we are a payment system and we are governed under the National Payment System Act. We are not a lender, and we leverage on the banking license to be able to, to roll out certain products and services. So we do not do this intermediation. And that's, that's key in terms of how we can innovate and partner with banks to be able to, to roll out relevant products and services. Today, before Fuliza started, we were averaging two loans per second when Fuliza came, and Fuliza is the world's first contextual overdraft. So we Googled it and said, when was the first overdraft done? I think the first overdraft was done in 1776 by the Royal Bank of Scotland. We are very proud to say that on 5th January last year, M-Pesa did the first contextual overdraft on a mobile money platform. 
it has been revolutionary in terms of in less than a year and a half, we've been able to, to lend over $6 billion uh, or micro loans uh, from an overdraft perspective uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an NPL performance of less than 1%. And this is where we leverage on data, big data, machine learning and AI to be able to, to collaborate with the banks to be able to roll out such a, a unique uh, product, uh, product proposition. But all this cannot be done without key to this topic is the agent network. The distribution is a key component uh, in driving financial services. Banks are rolling out agency bankings, mobile money players have uh, mobile money agents. Today, for example, in Kenya, we have about 200,000 agents and we know the banks have about 40,000 uh, or so uh, agent, agency banking. And this agent distribution is key uh, for the growth of financial services because not only do they provide cash in and cash out, uh, they do educate customers. They're a source of uh, uh, customer support. We do provide them a profit story. So we enable our, our agents to be able to, to sell other products and services such as airtime, insurance, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And so do banks do that. So we see this as a key enabler uh, in terms of education, as well as in terms of driving financial inclusion. With regard to COVID, for example, it has been, it has been a big challenge as cash has not been seen as key. And I just want to talk about COVID just for a second. While COVID has been devastating to the health care systems in the world, as well as a, an economic crisis, when it comes to financial services, it has been a big boost. And I say this because cash has been touted as a form of transmission. And we've seen a big drive in people shunning cash and accelerating cashless uh, transactions. Today in m which was already growing quite well, we are seeing the transactions that would have done in probably two, three years have happened in six months in terms of the growth. And this has been phenomenal in terms of now customers have shifted uh, their behaviors into digital. And this has made us now look at what other products and services can we offer? How can we uh, take advantage of this? And how can we ensure that our agents also have float uh, in the market? So there have been various uh, initiatives that have been done, even for agents connecting their agents still to their bank account and then them being able to do mobile banking the same way a customer does has been revolutionary in terms of they do not have to leave their shop to actually get uh, cash into, the, into it. Where do we see uh, the growth? So when I say when COVID came, we had to respond. And the response that was there was zero rating transactions, helping the government disburse uh, funds to vulnerable people in, across the country. Today, over 2 million people have received funds from the government. Uh, transactions below $10 are free. Transactions between bank to MPESA are free. Uh, merchant transactions are free. So what we've done was, was cushion. That was the response. Right now we are on the rebuild. As the economy begins, to, like economies begin to open. We are on the rebuild stage. And the rebuild stage, what we are saying is, how do we help SMEs? We've seen a drop of almost forty to fifty percent on of SMEs on our platform. We have five point four million micro SMEs and over two hundred thousand SMEs in our in our system. We've seen a big drop because as the economy closed down they were the most impacted. Now we're looking at how do we put capacity improvement, we give them capacity tools, we're giving them, we've developed a business app, and we've also, we're also looking at lending propositions dedicated towards SMEs. The, third, the second bit we're looking at is on how can we leverage on technology, AI, machine learning, biometrics, to ensure that KYC, AML, compliance, cybersecurity issues are addressed and, and, and also system stability. And that ensures that customers are, are, are feel safe to transact within our platform. The last bit is on the third phase. So those rebuild, I mean, those response rebuild are now reimagined. The reimagined phase is businesses have, businesses have changed and customers have changed tremendously. And it will be, a, we see it as a permanent change because of COVID. So how do will businesses operate in the future? It's going to be more digital. It's going to be, we have to provide more cloud services. We have to pro move into areas such as software as a service. So we are seeing that uh, and, and are developing 
what we're calling a super app that enables the customer to have all services as part of its lifestyle uh, platform. So those are the areas that I just wanted to, to highlight and just give a bit of context of where we are. Uh, and just uh, lastly, just say I'm grateful to be here and I'm thankful uh, for the audience. Thank you. Back to you, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you so much, Tutorio. I can't help but uh, be uh, struck by your, your comment about how impactful that COVID is being to your business. Obviously, you have a super successful business already where you've moved people into mobile financial services and you're still seeing um, growth around, well, this health crisis that we're having. I mean, what yeah. do you think that, that, you know, other than more business and opportunities, how do you see that affecting your customer base in the country as a whole? I think just, just to, to, to the, my first point on financial health, I think what we've seen is as people have gone digital, that they're willing to save. So the few products and, and services that we have on savings, we've seen a growth in them. So we are looking at as the velocity of funds are going uh, are coming into the ecosystem is what opportunities do we have to drive financial health? So we're looking at the same at wealth management solutions. We're looking at uh, uh, Emma Kiba, which is the which is the government bond, that, uh, the government mobile bond. That can, can we uh, accelerate that? So we're looking at different solutions for customers to be able to cushion them uh, for, from this. But in the meantime, we're also looking at how do we uh, encourage more transactions within the ecosystem that are more digital. And the SME are actually the, will be the biggest beneficiary for this. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, if we get one positive thing out of this horrible health crisis that we're facing, I think it is moving faster into more digital, more mobile financial services. And uh, that is, that, that's a good thing. And Elizabeth, it's not just in Kenya. I think if you look at the tech stocks, uh, when it's Amazon, because businesses have realized they could not they could not have their IT systems in the office. So there's a big move to cloud services. There's a big move to technology. So we are seeing that tech companies are actually uh, sort of uh, being accelerated uh, in this, and their shares are, are, are a testament to that. <laughs> yes, I don't know that Amazon needed any more help, but uh, they got it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, well, I'm so thankful that you uh, were able to join us today and, and share a scene setting for this. We also have a tremendous uh, panel here with us today, representing um, the, you know, the African Development Bank, as well as uh, FinTech sector and banking and uh, telco in, uh, in Nigeria. I'm going to uh, ask a few questions to the panel. And if you'd like, you can also introduce your institution. Uh, for everyone that's joining us, I'm Elizabeth McQuarrie, and I have the, the pleasure to contribute from time to time on financial uh, inclusion related projects throughout Africa. And I'm just very you know, grateful to be here with you today and learn your perspectives. So we wanna focus in on payment service banks and the opportunity for financial inclusion. This is a concept that is growing. I think it perhaps first started in India, but is now taking hold in Nigeria where we have our uh, FinTech week uh, uh, underway. And I'd like to hear a little bit of the perspective from the panel on what the what the true opportunity is here. And I think Ugochi, you were, um, you had some thoughts on what this true opportunity for the payment service banks and financial inclusion is. If I could ask you to share your thoughts. Yes. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. I think that the payments is very, is very crucial and vital for um, financial inclusion, especially for the unbanked and the underbanked. You know, um, in talking about financial inclusion, we would look at the unbanked se um, sector and then also look at 
the excluded um, um, part of the economy. And then we're going to have to look at what it means to be unbanked. So really, for unbanked are people who really don't have access to the mainstream financial services, and you know they don't have the current account or anything like that. And globally, this figure is about 1.7 billion adults who lack an account. And if you, if you bring it back home to Nigeria, you will find that we have a total population of about 99.6 million adults. And out of this number, about 60 million are unbanked. And you can see that there is a huge, there is a huge gap there. And this is something that the banking payment systems can really um, solve, you know, in, in um, how would I say, providing a platform to bring this um, population to the net. So some of these people are uh, people in the rural areas. Some of them are farmers and petty traders that we have. And we also found that um, out of the 1.7 billion adults in worldwide who do not have um, accounts, about 56% of them are female. So if you're talking about financial inclusion, you talk about it robustly. Um, and in that sense, we are going to also look at really what does financial inclusion mean for us in this, um, in Nigeria. So really financial inclusion really just means, you know, the percentage of the population that, you know, and businesses that use financial services. And then, we can, these are people who have access to financial services. So in Nigeria, a lot of people still um, keep their monies in their homes. They don't um, maybe trust the banking system for some reason. Um, some other reasons that they provide are that they can't, you know, transport themselves to the traditional banks. And so they have to keep their money themselves. And if you look at the exclusion rates in Nigeria, about 36.8% uh, of adult population in this country are still financially excluded. Uh, more than half of that number are female. Ugochi, I think uh, somehow it, you got muted. Okay, can, can yeah. you hear me now? Better. Yes. Okay. So I think the first step in financial inclusion is really um, having, the, having the bank account. So first of all, having a transaction account, um, which the traditional banks may not be able to reach this strata of uh, people. And so we find that beyond having the bank account, the next step really is how to use them. And, um, and for these products and services to work, you have to talk about the price, the convenience, the simplicity, and the security of, um, of these financial services. And I think that that's where um, the payment system really helps. Well, that's a, you, you've set the stage for a lot of good uh, follow-up here because you, you have you know, framed the challenge as being much more than just a transaction account, right? which itself uh, can be a challenge in many cases. And uh, thinking about the, the payment service bank and uh, agency banking opportunity directly in Nigeria, I'm gonna actually um, move to get the views from uh, Alan and Nine Mobile because you have the opportunity to serve both in, well, your broader company, to serve in the financial services as well as the uh, ICT sector, both of which are, you know, have challenges for, for Nigeria. So give us your perspective on, on where we are, if you would, please, Alon. I can't hear you. You're somehow, we're not hearing you, Alon, unfortunately. Must be um, the volume on your side, your microphone. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Well, uh, with this moment of technical difficulty, I, I am going to uh, ask Hassan to give us some thoughts. <laughs> You're also on mute, Hassan, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, my other colleagues on this panel. Uh, I'm pleased meeting you all. Um, uh, I, I want to take over from uh, Ugochi. She mentioned the level of financial exclusion in Nigeria uh, and the female um, proportion of that. Uh, but one thing from my organization, Jais Bank, which is a non-interest bank, an Islamic bank, offering uh, alternative type of finance to the conventional. Uh, our study and what we looked at is that really financial inclusion in Nigeria, it's not just about access, it's about um, um, uh, affordability. Uh, what, what, what we see is that majority of those that are excluded are excluded not on purpose, not because they, they also cannot accept, but it's because they don't even have um, the the capacity to to, to transact uh, money uh, or to have access that they can use a banking service. Uh, so from our perspective, and then um, taking from uh, Ogochi and confirming that the, the women folks in Nigeria, especially in, uh, in the northern part of the country, are the most excluded. Uh, we started experimentation with going to the locality. Yes, we know that digital is the end, but then you have to, first of all, even interact and understand what really is the, 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 the issue. So we started female uh, uh, only branches in, in some local governments uh, and currently running a pilot uh, with about 4,000 women. And we are not giving them loans. We give them um, an equity type of funding to do what uh, they consider their, uh, their trade to increase their capacity. Uh, and we've done for about a year now. Uh, what we see is a big shift in understanding the, the capacity of the financial institution to support and uh, uh, enable growth in, especially in areas where uh, you don't have um, financial institution, you also do not have uh, a, a, an economic activity that is taking place all, I mean, day in, day out. So we, our um, uh, uh, experience shows that you can work with these um, women, grow their capacity, and then gradually even layer uh, uh, more services. So for example, after, the first one year, we're able to now put a takaful uh, insurance, that's uh, the Islamic uh, insurance on top of the offering. So we, we cover this woman um, for um, um, fire, um, some property theft and what have you, to a level that, you know, uh, they, they don't even feel um, the, the expense because we are not asking uh, from the income that we make, we, we pay for the premium which is uh, quite affordable from our point of view. So this um, program, we would like to replicate, but of course we cannot scale using a, um, actual presence. We can do pilot uh, uh, physically to understand the psyche of the people to see how we can do this business, but to scale, we then need to uh, use technology and we are looking at various options now, how to, uh, uh, retain um, agents around uh, the women groups who will then be like our representative in those locations, mm -hmm. will deliver those uh, services and uh, ensure that the collectivity, because again, one of the good things about uh, what we do is we meet with this woman every month. So in cycle, each group will come at least once in four weeks to tell us what happened because we are, we are not expecting a fixed amount of return. So it depends on what has happened. And you can see the level of trust that this endangers 
and also the community that uh, you, you eventually create. Now, uh, this is one model. The other model we are building around delivering our own type of product around agency banking. So uh, the agents uh, and their team leads are now retained as our representative who will ensure that uh, the funding we give uh, is um, cascaded downstairs to those who need the funding, which is usually uh, we sell uh, rather than give a loan. We sell, uh, if we are not partnering, we will then sell the product to, to the customer. And then uh, in 30 days or uh, uh, 60 days, depending on the timing, we'll now come back and then we'll sell again. So this continuously uh, takes place. So yes, there is a challenge uh, getting to the 80% financial inclusion that central bank is targeting, but uh, many actors will have to work in their own space using their own type of delivery and products to be able to, to, to deliver on this. But of course, eventually, we all have to use uh, technology to make it cost effective and to also scale as quickly as possible because the, 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 the work to be done is, is large and the, the opportunity to tap this market is also large, you know. Oh, absolutely. You, uh... Pick on the, the pick up on the scale point, and that is really that's the true need because the well, obviously we need more folks with a transactions account. Tra excuse me, transaction accounts, but getting it, you know, massified, if you will, out to as many people as possible at the affordable price point is the true challenge. And I see Alan is back. I hope that we've been able to solve your... Um... I don't know. Can you hear me now, Elizabeth? Perfect. We do, yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, so we wanted to get your perspective on uh, the payment service bank opportunity to reach the scale, and as well as um, agency banking, if you want to comment on that as well, because I assume you're going to be linking into some agent networks. So I'd like to hear your perspective uh, from for Nigeria on this question. Okay, well, thank, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to join the forum and also for the chance to uh, address that question. Um, just as a quick introduction, my name's Alan Sinfield. I'm uh, recently appointed as the CEO of Nine Mobile, which is one of the four large uh, larger, I should say, operators, uh, mobile operators in Nigeria. Um, we were recently awarded a license, a, a payment service bank license. Um, one of the points you made earlier on, which was quite interesting, was um, about some of the, uh, the complexities. And um, I think uh, it's already been kind of touched on. But when you look at the, the size of Nigeria, um, 206 million people and growing, um, and then, you know, the size of the addressable market from a banking standpoint, an adult standpoint, is over 100 million people. And as has already been mentioned, only a circa less than 50 percent of those are banked. So, you know, th there's a huge potential in that sense for the for the market. But equally, there's a lot of challenges that face payment service banks that equally face telecom companies, uh, mobile operators. And I believe it was already mentioned, you know, what, what are some of the things that will make a payment service bank successful? And it will be around accessibility, affordability, simplicity, convenience and security. And when, and when you look at that, that also holds very true from a network operator standpoint as well, which is really uh, being able to access service and to do so in an affordable way uh, and in a way that makes sense and provides real value to customers. So when you, when you look at it in that sense, I think the, 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 there's a lot of close similarities between um, mobile operators and payment service banks. But just specifically to talk to the, the, the potential of a payment service bank, it comes with a lot of challenges, obviously, because... Um, the, the breadth and the size, the sheer size of Nigeria as a country and being able to achieve what the government and very commendably the government and the central bank have set out to do by awarding these licenses is to try and improve financial inclusion and especially the unbanked and in rural communities. And that lends itself very well to the agency banking model, as we're all aware. 
Um, when you consider, you, you asked one question, Elizabeth, which was, you know, will we leverage a, an agency banking model? And, and of course we will. Uh, Nine Mobile as a company, we have around uh, in excess of 40,000 dealer points of sale in country. So we very much intend to enable all of those as be to become um, agents for us for PSB. Um, so that gives a sense of uh, depth. But when you hear what um, uh, our colleague from um, MPESA just mentioned around having 200,000 agents, you can see that we also have to significantly grow on uh, our agent footprint as a mobile operator um, and, and to support PSB uh, as, a, or as, as our, we will be launching nine PSB. The, um, the opportunity there for us as well is, is very much that we have taken a stance that uh, we don't want to be just ring fenced on nine mobile the way that we've structured nine psb is it's an operator agnostic platform so it will run on any of the other networks in country as well because we want to try and support the government achieve its goals of, inf of financial inclusion so we don't want to limit that by just saying only, only opera only customers on my network can 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 use uh, our nine psb license that, that that's not the purpose of this at all and when you look at the uh, the potential benefits, the potential economic benefits of increasing uh, financial services and financial inclusion in Nigeria. You know, a lot of the research that we conducted and, and, and paid for research in the market, there, there's, there's, there's statistics or there's reports that will, that will um, justify that potentially by the rollout of the, the PSB licenses, by the th there's three companies that have been awarded a PSB license in Nigeria, in the rollout of these, there is a potential for boosting GDP growth by over 12% in the next five years. When you put that in real terms, that's over or approaching 90 billion US dollars that that could add to the economy. There's huge potential to increasing new jobs, and obviously empowering these rural communities and, and it's not just rural communities because the types of products and services we can launch as 9PSB will also appeal to the mainstay of, 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 of existing banked clients, uh, pay in, pay out, um, uh, savings, debit cards, uh, credit cards, ATM solutions, lots of different solutions that we can come to market with. So there is a real potential for this to considerably grow within, uh, within the, the market. But um, I think um, if I just sum up really, I, I mentioned there's equal challenges. Challenges is definitely a reach. You know, that, that's a key thing that we have to achieve and we're working very hard on looking at how do we expand and, and really target and support the government achieve its goals of financial inclusion. Because we also look at that, that once you've achieved financial inclusion, that then leads on to digital inclusion. And then people have, once they're, once they're financially included, they have access to um, other support other products and services things that can help them in their everyday lives and so forth and and i think that that's what's the really empowering factor behind uh, the introduction of these these psb licenses and uh, we're, we're very proud to have been awarded one and uh, looking very <laughs> looking forward to deploying uh, to actually launching that in the near future thank you yeah, and very much congratulations on that i know it's a highly coveted uh uh, achievement that, that you have. I'm sure it took a lot of effort to get there too. <laughs> and I would like to um, actually sort of broaden us from Nigeria now just a little bit to the rest of Africa and ask Jamalino from your perspective, how does what is going on in or all the developments underway in Nigeria right now, how does that compare to, you know, how you see the rest of Africa from your, you know, I think very interesting vantage point uh, at the African Development Bank. And after Jamalino, I'd like to um, get to some of our questions, which uh, originally uh, will take us back to Satoyo. He has the first questions as he got the first uh, uh, position this morning. So Jamalino, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Elizabeth. Thanks for the opportunity. Delighted to be here at this great event. So my name is Jamilino Akobito. So I'm digital financial services specialist working at um, at uh, Adfi. So Adfi uh, is actu uh, actually the Africa Digital Financial Inclusion Facility. So it is a multi-donor trust fund established last year. 
composed of the African Development Bank, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the government of Luxembourg, uh, Agence Française de, de Développement, and recently the government of France through the Ministry of Finance. So uh, at fee projects actually to, to reach 332 million financially excluded people across all the continents. So how this, um, this number has been determined, uh, let's say that we, we have uh, made an assessment of uh, all the gaps in terms of financial inclusion uh, across the continent. And we realized that we have about 332 million customers who own a mobile phone, uh, let's say economically active, so potentially could be in embodied into the financial, uh, financial ecosystem. So we at ATFI, we will be focusing for the 10, uh, next 10 years uh, on uh, onboarding these people uh, with uh, a focus on women. So uh, I think Ugochi talks about this uh, gender gap. We, we, we are envisioning to close the gender gap. So uh, for 60 percent of uh, our project will be gender intentional or gender transformative. We uh, we will be working along four pillars: so infrastructure, uh, policy and regulation, product and innovation, and capacity building. But I can also say that gender for us is a, a kind of cross-cutting pillar because it's something that is very 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 critical. So as I said. Um, the total addressable market across all the continent is 332 million. So we'll be working to, to reach this, uh, this number. Uh, and when we look at the numbers in terms of mobile subscription, we know that across the continent, we have something like 75% of the population in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa who owned uh, a mobile phone. So it is a big opportunity in terms of uh, digital financial inclusion. Uh, you guys have shared some um, data on the financial inclusion uh, uh, space in, uh, in Nigeria. But what I can say is that Nigeria for us is the highest, highest total addressable market. <laughs> so it is a key country where we want to work. And one of the things we, we, we will be doing, we, are, we will be focused on many uh, 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 intervention areas. But right now, the access is very critical for us. So that's why we are seeing the, the possibility to work in the north of Nigeria to increase the access. So uh, we know that uh, this, in this uh, area, there are too many challenges in terms of access. We also know that there is a huge gender gap in this area. So we will support a super agent woman network operator based in, uh, in Nigeria to develop a kind of a women-centric agent network in Nigeria, because we know that women are more efficient as agents. The idea is also to empower women, to create more employment, to give them more opportunities, but also we, we are pretty sure that women could, so when I say women, female customers will be better served by women agents. So that's why we, we are working to launch this project and that will be one of uh, our key uh, priorities for, for the next years. But again, uh, we know there are some challenges also in terms of regulation, uh, in uh, consumer protection, regulation to promote digital financial in, uh, inclusion by DFS players. So that will be probably uh, the the key, the key focus areas of in our, our intervention in, uh, in, uh, in Nigeria. Oh, so uh, to, to finish on that, so I know uh, Sitoyo has uh, shared some data about what's happening uh, uh, in, uh, in the rest of, in, uh, in Kenya. So we all know that uh, the East Africa and especially Kenya and Uganda are ahead uh, Nigeria for us is a kind of growth potential market because we made a segmentation into four, five categories, uh, five, five clusters. And uh, we have the advanced market, we have the intermediate market, ETC, the inception market. But for us, from our strategy, we are seeing Nigeria like uh, as a, a growth potential. There are some uh, good prerequisites 
uh, there is a solid financial ecosystem, even if the, it needs a, a kind of improvement. But in terms of development or digital finance, there are too many challenges. So how we, 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 we will support Nigeria as a country to, to, to leverage on this potential to, to develop the, the digital financial inclusion, uh, inclusion ecosystem. That's one of uh, the, the biggest challenges we, we have now at ACRI. Absolutely, I, I think the, you know, the, the most underserved and the more excluded regions, as you talked about gen, you know, women, perhaps in Northern Nigeria, that brings up all sorts of um, really important challenges that need to be uh, addressed. Obviously attainable, but not necessarily easy. And actually, we have a couple of questions in that are re quite related to that for Sitoyo and thinking about these uh, more rural, hard to reach areas that um, particularly uh, uh, populations such as refugees and those in remote areas, as well as um, the general issue of um, School fees uh, has also come up to collect payments in remote areas, particularly from uh, schools and what MPESA might be able to do to improve the opportunities for the, those populations. Thanks a little bit, and that's a great question. I think I would like to start by saying, you know, uh, financial inclusion is for all, and uh, it doesn't matter where, you, where, where you've come from. And uh, we use M-Pesa uh, is for all also, that, that same statement. Uh, Kenya today hosts the largest refugee camp in, in the world, uh, in Dadaab and uh, Kakuma refugee camps. And uh, we've been able to work with the World Food Programme to be able to provide digital solutions for refugees. So the World Food Programme does provide funding for, and it used to do it using cash uh, to refugees and they had to take a truck and actually give money on a weekly basis. Uh, we've digitized that and, and, and we've enabled uh, use of M-Pesa uh, and restricting it because of the, all the issues with regard to KYC and so on and so forth, to be able to be used in a closed loop uh, solution, uh, what we, which we call SuaPay. So they are able to, to use it in a hospital in the refugee camp, a, a, a dispensary in the refugee camp, a, a restaurant in the refugee camp. So it's actually closed. Uh, Closed up solution, and that has been uh, one of the solutions that we have actually provided for for the for for, um, uh, for the refugees. Uh, in in Kenya, there are 1.4 million visually impaired people. So, and they are registered on MPESA. So, how do you provide financial inclusion for that? So, we've partnered uh, with the South Korean company Dot Braille uh, company, and we 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 uh, we launched a year and a half ago a Dot Braille watch, which is highly subsidized. And that enables them to pair um, uh, their phone with with a watch and be able to access. Because visually impaired people used to go to the agent and have to give the agent has to do the transaction for them. And there was a lot of, of course, uh, fraud that happens. There. We also introduced voice biometric for Mpesa, and that enables them to to, to actually transact. So there are different categories uh, that that uh, uh, we're able to touch base. With regard to breath, as a telecommunication company, we cover today 90% of the population. But 90% of the population may mean certain smaller areas and rural areas that are not touched. So the government through the communication authority has a, has a fund that enables uh, the telcos to, the telcos contribute to, and there's the, we are able to provide coverage in areas that traditionally you would say are not um, uh, economical in terms of putting base stations. So we, we do that. Today in Kenya, uh, the wide area network for agents, even in rural areas means you do not have to walk one more than three kilometers to actually get uh, an agent. And this is something Alan talked about in terms of the breadth of, of, of distribution. You really need to have a wide distribution network to be able to, uh, to get that. In terms of women, uh, and it's interesting, in Mpesa, over 50% of the active users are women. So it's actually, and even in our savings products, uh, the, the best payers are women. <laughs> People who save the most are women. So we are looking at those different segments and looking at how our technologies uh, that I mentioned, AI, and, and, and how do we give them more credit and, and more products and services tailored towards them. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the world repeatedly shows us that women are the best savers. Uh, if only women made as much money as men around the world, uh, we might have that GDP number moved in a lot of countries. I believe it was uh, Jamilino who gave us, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was Alan who shared a potential 12% GDP growth in Nigeria over five years uh, for, from the possibility of uh, payment service banks um, moving us forward. So we only have about seven minutes left. I'd like to ask for any closing thoughts from the, the panelists on really what we should be focusing on most immediately to solve some of the challenges that we have um, seen here. And I will start with um, uh, Jamilino, go to Igochi, and then to Alan um, and Hassan, and back finally to uh, Sitoyo for a last uh, comment, if I could. So Jamilino? Yeah, so I'll go quickly. Um, as I said, uh, we, we have four pillars. So I propose one action per, per pillar. Uh, from the infrastructure perspective, I think that um, that would be important to, to reinforce uh, the, inter uh, the payment system, the interoperability to make it to, to have a kind of full interoperability. That would be very important. And uh, also from the uh, infrastructure pers perspective, I think uh, Nigeria needs to strengthen the agent network in the, in the, server, uh, in the rural areas. So it's something we we can work on. Uh, from the product innovation perspective, I think that fintech are a bit aggressive in Nigeria. We can recognize that there is a, <laughs> a dynamic sector, fintech sector. So uh, maybe from our perspective, we, we would like to, to support fintechs uh, financially, technically. So that will be uh, our focus to, to work on the key economic areas such as uh, uh, um, Agriculture, agriculture, insurance, education, health. So that will be the, the focus area. From the policy and regulation perspective, that is very important. As I said, I'm, I, I'm totally sure that there is a need to, to reinforce the, the legal framework in Nigeria. So we can uh, bring our assistance to, to reinforce, uh, maybe to do a kind of uh, regulatory reform. And uh, last but also uh, the, not the least, uh, uh, the capacity building. The capacity building under the capacity building perspective, I think uh, it's also linked to, to think the FinTech sector. We, we need to support DFS player, DFS stakeholders in terms of capacity, uh, in terms of capacity building. And again, I think that gender is something that is very critical. The gender gap is very, very uh, high in the rural areas. So, uh, there is, um, it should be a priority to work on. Absolutely. Ogochi, what's the most important thing from your perspective that we can contribute? Okay, um, that's a very good question. I would say that um, one of the vital things, first of all, is really to get the unbanked to bank. Um, I think that's the first step. And then the next is really looking at the scale. So really are the policies being delivered at scale, you know, such as the digital ID that was uh, deployed in India, taking a cue from India, um, also is the influence of the regulatory bodies as well. So we can see that um, some, most countries have uh, tapped into the national financial inclusion strategy um, same as Nigeria, which led, of course, to the Payment uh, Service Bank uh, Initiative and the Agency Banking Network. So I think that all of this together, um, including the bank, so the bank and everybody really needs to put hands together to, to um, see that number move. Absolutely. Thank you, Gochi. Uh, Alan, one thing, we just have just a couple of moments and then we'll go to Hassan. One thing, very quickly, cooperation. Um, infrastructure is key around, around all of what we've been discussing. And a lot of the latest innovations as, that we can bring as a network operator are the use of things like open RAN technology, 
um, network virtualization and also looking at even more simple things that have been around for a long time that we've only now just started to trial in Nigeria, which is around national roaming, which is basically cooperating on getting a better return for the investment. So, you know, I'll roll my network out in this area and I'll swap my network there with another operator that will roll out in this area. So getting a better return on your money. So very key is cooperation by the infrastructure builders and, and providers like mobile network operators and the fiber providers and so on, which we, we all play a, a large part on in, in Nigeria. The other element of cooperation is cooperation with the existing banking community as well. We're already talking to banks that don't have large branch networks but they have good products and services that would be would appeal to some of the rural communities so we're looking at how do we partner how do we cooperate and cbn again um, is a very forward thinking uh, regulatory body the central bank of nigeria so we're having some good cooperation from them in terms of how can we extend the footprint of existing banks and cooperate with them especially to uh, rural communities so for me i think what one word then cooperation Fantastic. Thank you. That's a good word. Uh, we'll work to achieve it. And Hassan? We can't hear you yet. I cannot but agree with Alan. Um, cooperation, especially between uh, the financial institutions and the mobile operators, yeah. even around charges is an issue in Nigeria where, uh, you know, what do you charge and who do you charge on uh, USSD, for example, the uh, uh, payment instruction by customers. The other thing in Nigeria, I think that is important uh, for you to deliver um, loans or financing to customers is the identity management, which I know the government is trying to do some about, but it's very key, it's very important that um, uh, this uh, is delivered uh, to as many Nigerians as possible. So, you know, when an institution is dealing with this person, that's the person you are dealing with. And you can be able, in case uh, of recovery, you'll be able to reach back and get that person to pay back. Absolutely, ID is critical. Um, and a lot of good uh, activity going on around it, fortunately. Satoyo, what is the one thing that we you would like us to focus on to help close this tremendously important gap? I think it, 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 it's, it's critical that uh, we open our platforms, have open APIs, uh, encourage the fintechs. Um, it was great to see Paystack, uh, a fintech in Nigeria, uh, bought by Stripe for $200 million. I think the more we, we open an, uh, our platform, both the telcos as well as the banks and not to be cl uh, closed, I think we, if we encourage the fintechs uh, uh, to, to play a, a key role in driving uh, financial inclusion would be great. And I keep on saying, I really hope uh, that we get our first African unicorn, uh, our first billion dollar FinTech uh, quite soon. And uh, I'm hoping the next 12 months. Um, well, I thought that was you in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are, we are still part of Safaricom. So it, we're not a separate legal entity. Uh, so. Uh, it's great to see the fintechs uh, uh, leveraging on our platform uh, and actually getting some great valuation we are seeing, but it'd be great to see a, uh, um, a fintech uh, in Africa really go into the billion dollar mark. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I cannot thank you all enough for being here today and sharing your ideas. We have touched on a, a number of important aspects, I think, you know, food for thought for the next phase. And I, again, thank you so much and appreciate your time and wish you all uh, continued good health in this uh, trying period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, our members. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, job well done. Um, it's been a remarkable session, a lot of learnings. Uh, and I think one of the biggest takeaways is the fact that there needs to be increased collaboration amongst players, uh, fintechs, tel telcos, if banks, infrastructure uh, providers, you know, everyone together has to work as an ecosystem to help bridge the gap you know, the all important gap, like Elizabeth would say. 
Um, and, I, and I like the fact that Ogochi mentioned that, you know, we need to think scale as we build. Uh, scale is very important. Build that scale uh, to cover, I mean, Africa is a huge continent. Um, Nigeria is a huge country. There's a lot of work to be done um, and it's all possible. So thank you very much, um, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, Sitoyo. Uh, thank you, Gochi, and thank you, Demolino. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Hassan. Thank you all for your time this afternoon. I want to thank everyone that uh, stayed through this session, uh, the last session for day four. Uh, the session uh, comes to an end now. Um, so I want to say thank you, everyone. Uh, remember to use the hashtag, hashtag NFW2020, and hashtag Nigeria FinTech Week, hashtag day four. Uh, it's been a remarkable day. Uh, started today, we saw some product launches today. Uh, earlier in the day, we also saw, saw the, pro, uh, the Nine Mobile product launch. Uh, and now we're hearing Alan share some of the thoughts that Nine Mobile has around the, the agency banking uh, ecosystem. So thank you very much. Uh, we wish every one of you all the best. Um, so on that note, we want to thank you for staying with us through day four. Uh, remember, you can visit the exhibition booth. And you can also interact with all the speakers and all the panelists uh, via the platform. Uh, you can book meetings, you can reach out to them, um, and you can also ask your questions. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow starts at exactly uh, 10 a.m. We look forward to your time tomorrow. Uh, thank you for making uh, the Nigeria FinTech Week 2020 a reality. And thank you to all our partners that have supported us and made this possible. So thank you very much, and we wish everyone a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.